Her initial illness was mono, and that included the excessive fatigue that then led to the immune system response, which resulted in this disease process reaction. So as the disease progressed, it started at the very bottom of my spinal cord, attacking these nerves, and then just worked its way up. Next, Travis Walker faces a horrifying illness that threatens to take his life. On this episode, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. I was freaking out, just completely beside myself with pain and just worried. What is going on? Tammy Gilliland's life begins to spiral out of control when a horrifying condition stops her dead in her tracks. I couldn't feel my legs. From the waist down, I couldn't feel at all. She was hooked up to heart monitors and uh, oxygen, and we were scared to death at that point. Then, when a horrifying lesion engulfs Travis Walker's hand, his wife Jenna embarks on a desperate mission to save his life. The abscess was so bad, there was fluid oozing out of his finger. It's overwhelming, you know, I just start crying. I felt like we were running out of time. All I could do was pray. When illness strikes, we look to doctors to give us answers. But what if they can't? For these unlucky patients, diagnosis is a mystery. In the fall of 1998, Tammy Gilliland had just graduated from college and was thrilled to be starting a life of her own in Springfield, Missouri. Even more exciting was the fact that she and her sister Julie had just moved into their first apartment together. Julie and I are such a great friends and we're just so close. Tammy was in a position at a bank. I was working for a small newspaper. We were very excited to be on our own and having somebody that we could trust to live with. I would end my day at five, and then I would have plans every night. I always had plans to, you know, meet a friend, go to the gym, go to the mall shopping, babysit a friend's child. I mean, it was constant, constant, constant going, which I loved, you know, that was just part of me. I'm just extremely energetic and, and always on the go. Tammy and I had so much fun living in Springfield. We were very social with the people that we went to church with. We would have uh, people over for dinner parties at our house, entertained a lot. You know, just kind of the regular, you know, sister hanging out stuff. As Tammy juggles her busy schedule with ease, she has no clue that everything is about to change one chilly day in November. I was starting to feel so fatigued and tired, and uh, it was so unusual for me. Something was making me so exhausted. The way Tammy described how she was feeling, it sounded like maybe she had the flu. It progressively got worse to the point where I felt completely debilitated um, and exhausted. Like, I did not even want to get out of bed in the morning. She could get through work, but then she needed to come home. She needed to, to go to sleep. She went into almost like hibernation mode because she just didn't have the energy. I finally was like, I've got to go in and see what's going on, because this is just not normal. Four weeks of just complete exhaustion without ever getting over it. So I went and I saw the doctor. They did a blood test uh, because they thought possibly there was uh, some virus related to this. And they found uh, that it was mono. Mononucleosis is a viral infection that causes fever, sore throat, and extreme fatigue. Which explains why I felt so bad for so long. Mono was what was causing all the fatigue initially, the achiness, just, you know, feeling crappy. She told me to go home and get some rest and drink a lot of liquids. Tammy took the doctor's advice. She got rest, she drank lots of fluids, but she was still just not feeling like herself. While Tammy follows the doctor's orders to a T, there are no signs of improvement. And just two days later, a bizarre new symptom suddenly emerges. I realized I had not been able to go to the bathroom all morning. So I go in the bathroom, 
I'm back there for like half an hour and I just cannot go to the bathroom. It's very painful at this point because I need to go, but I can't actually make myself go. Water running, toilet flushing, nothing could help me actually urinate. And I called the doctor's office and they were able to, to get me in that afternoon. I got to the doctor's office and I told her that, you know, I, I can't go to the bathroom. I need to urinate, but I can't. So the doctor says, you know, let's try all the usual things. I'll bring you some water. I was in this room for about three hours, drinking water, can't go to the bathroom. It was just this completely foreign feeling of just pressure and uh, just almost kind of like a desperate, anxious feeling. It was very uncomfortable. And she said, you know, let's go ahead and just catheterize you. A catheter is a thin, flexible tube used to drain fluid from the bladder. Once they catheterized me, it was literally just instant relief. Just, oh, the pressure was gone and I felt like, okay, I can cope again. <laughs> they do an immediate test in the office to see if they see an infection or blood cells in the urine. And she believed that it was a bladder infection. I had had bladder infections before, but never had any symptoms like this. Nothing like this. She gave me a prescription for an antibiotic. The doctor also told me, get soup on the way home, drink just as much liquid as you can get, and flush this infection out of your system. I wasn't sure what to think. I definitely was raised that, you know, when a doctor tells you something, that that's just the gospel. And, you know, okay, I must be overreacting. I need to go home and get some rest and drink a lot of liquids. So I leave the doctor's office and I get like a quart of soup and a large soda and I get home. I drink the entire soda. I drink all of the soup. I drink several glasses of water on top of that. So I am just sure that I'm going to be able to urinate following all of this liquid. But as the hours go by, Tammy still isn't able to relieve herself. I was pacing back and forth, just feeling so much pressure. It was much worse than it was earlier in the day because I had drank so much liquid. It was just unbearable. By this time, I am so desperate and absolutely panic-stricken that I can't go to the bathroom. I was in so much pain, I can't even stand up straight. Tammy called me and she was so upset. She couldn't even get the words out. I mean, she was crying because she was hurting so bad. I said, Julie, I can't wait any longer. This is a total emergency. I have to go to the emergency room and I cannot drive myself. Please come and get me. She left work immediately. Tammy was almost doubled over in pain. She looked kind of like a freight train hitter. She was in rough shape. I am starting to feel like it's an emergency, like there's something really wrong. I was so uncomfortable. I was freaking out, just completely beside myself with discomfort and pain and just worried. What is going on? So we went to the emergency room immediately. We arrived at the hospital and I described to them how much pain I was in and how much liquid I had ingested that afternoon. So they catheterized me right away and they took out about a liter of liquid. That's a lot of liquid. They were totally astounded. That is probably about four times what would normally ever be in someone's bladder at once. Next, the ER doctor begins performing a round of tests, hoping to figure out what triggered the incapacitating episode. They tested my urine at the hospital and they said, we don't see an infection there. We don't know what's causing the problem. So they left the catheter in and told me to see the urologist the next morning. I drove Tammy home after she had gotten the catheter and she was so upset I'm a completely healthy 25-year-old active woman, and uh, all of a sudden I have a catheter in. I was fine, and now all of a sudden I, I can't go to the bathroom. It was embarrassing and just completely foreign to me. I was so exhausted that I felt like I couldn't even pick up my feet, and I just went to sleep. I called my parents, and I told them to stop whatever they were doing. They needed to pack a bag, and they needed to come to Springfield. Right that minute, Tammy was really sick. I was trying to, you know, maintain and say, we're going to find out what it is. Mom and dad are on their way. Uh, don't worry, we're going to get through this. So I just, I tried to keep her as calm as I could. It was scary because I don't think Julie would have been the type to panic had 
had not been a really a serious issue. Then we just packed up within an hour. We were in the car headed for Missouri. <laughs> the drive from Denver to Springfield was about 14, 15 hours straight through. When we arrived at their house, she was just out of it. I don't even know how to describe it. She was in bed and so sick, and her bladder wouldn't work, and she was frightened. Mom and Dad took me to the urologist. The doctor examined me and took a sample of urine from the calf bag and um, cultured it and said, you know, again, no, we don't see an infection. Uh, he told uh, Mom and I that he's never seen a healthy 25-year-old with a bladder infection not be able to urinate. He was like, that is not a normal symptom of a urinary tract infection. The urologist wanted to examine me more thoroughly, but he wasn't able to because my bladder was so stretched out from all the liquid that I had been retaining. He was gonna have to just see me the next week and do the exam when the bladder had returned to its normal shape. With no choice but to wait yet another week for an answer, Tammy schedules a follow-up appointment with the doctor and heads back home. When we got back from the urologist, Tammy was so sick and tired that she could not climb the stairs. The last flight of stairs, she crawled on her hands and knees. I just wasn't able to physically walk. I didn't have the strength to make it up the stairs. It was terrible. It was horrible to see her like that. Exhausted, Tammy climbs into bed to rest. But it's not long before a terrifying new symptom sets in. Tammy had said, you know, I felt tingly. And, you know, of course, we were like, tingly, what does that mean? The tingling felt like pins and needles. And as it came up my body, I would have this sensation of tingling. And then below that would be numb, and above that would feel normal. It was a very uncomfortable feeling. Slowly that weekend, that tingling feeling just started creeping up my legs. So, you know, on Saturday, it was up to my knees. And on Sunday, it was up to my hips. I woke up that Monday morning, and I started to get out of bed, and I just immediately collapsed on the floor. I couldn't bear my own weight. I couldn't feel my legs. From the waist down, I couldn't feel at all. We heard Tammy fall. She was trying to get out of bed, and we heard her go down. They heard me hit the floor and they ran in immediately and I told them I cannot feel my legs. She couldn't use her legs. She couldn't get up. We were all terrified. I kept thinking to myself, I can't feel my legs. I can't feel my legs. Just panicking. I can't feel my legs. For the past four days, 25-year-old Tammy Gilliland hasn't been able to go to the bathroom. What her doctor first believed was a simple case of mono has taken a terrifying turn for the worse. And now, she can't feel or move her legs. In a state of panic, her mother and sister are racing her to the hospital. I remember collapsing, and then I don't remember anything again until being in the hospital. I don't even know. It was such a scary time. Dr. Lori McPherson, the on-call doctor, immediately takes over Tammy's case. When I met Tammy for the first time, she was too sick to really give much of her own history. I went ahead and did my own exam. I found that she had no sensation between sharp and dull from her feet up to her nipple line. She basically had evidence of paraplegia. She was unable to lift her legs, either one of them on her own. I remember her touching my feet and my legs with all kinds of different objects and, and doing reflex tests as well, but I don't remember feeling anything, like having zero sensation below the chest at this point. I thought, wow, we have something rapidly progressing. She's declining. My next step was to order an MRI of the central nervous system. While Tammy is wheeled off for the scan, her family waits anxiously. Nothing could have prepared them for what the images reveal. The results of Tammy's MRI showed significant brain lesions throughout her central nervous system. The brain lesions were indicative of multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, the body's immune system attacks the nerves of the brain and spinal cord. As a result, muscles weaken, and in severe cases, patients become immobile. My husband and I were both worried, 
that Tammy would be paralyzed. That's what we were fearing. When Dr. McPherson mentioned the possibility of MS, I immediately started thinking about how life would change for Tammy and I. I definitely thought that Tammy was going to be in a wheelchair. It was hard to emotionally cope with the, um, the severity of it. The next step was to do a lumbar puncture, which is a tap of the spinal fluid. In the cerebrospinal fluid, we can test for blood counts and protein levels. The next two hours are almost unbearable as Tammy begins to consider living with the incapacitating disease. Finally, when the results are in, they're nothing short of shocking. The results of her spinal fluids did not show any evidence of the normal things that we would find with multiple sclerosis. And at that time, I diagnosed her with acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM, is a rare neurological disorder that's often triggered by a viral infection. Normally, when a virus enters the body, antibodies spring into action and fight it off. But in patients like Tammy, the antibodies go haywire and begin to attack the brain and spinal cord. As a result, various systems in the body begin to malfunction. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is a response to a virus and the person's immune system overreacts and attacks its own central nervous system, the brain and the entire spinal cord. I had no idea what the disease was. I didn't know anything about it. I, it was totally foreign to me. I don't know if the diagnosis is a relief or just further worry. It sounded really bad to me. Not knowing anything about it made it sound worse. As the family struggles to understand Tammy's condition, Dr. McPherson explains how all of her symptoms are linked to ADEM. Her initial illness was mono, and that included the excessive fatigue that then led to the immune system response, which resulted in this disease process. The ADEM specifically attacked some of the nerves from her lower spinal cord that controlled her bladder. This resulted in her being unable to urinate on her own and actually caused the legs to become paralyzed. And then it eventually triggered this reaction. So as the disease progressed, it started at the very bottom of my spinal cord attacking these nerves and then just worked its way up. It was such a relief for the disease to have a name, for us to know what was going on with Tammy. But I wanted to know what the prognosis was. I mean, is, is Tammy gonna be okay? That's all I wanna know. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is a critical illness. It's an ascending paralysis from the feet up, and once it reaches the muscles of the chest wall, the patient is no longer able to breathe on their own and will die. She was hooked up to heart monitors and uh, oxygen, and she was just hooked up to so many things, and it scared me to death. In the spring of 2002, 32-year-old Travis Walker was living in the small town of Neosho, Missouri. Recently divorced, he'd adapted well to bachelorhood and spent his free time hanging out with his friends or reveling in his hobby. One of my hobbies is to take care of my fish. I really enjoy taking care of them. I have a 55-gallon fish tank. I fed goldfish, ball of sharks, and um, some cichlids, and I'm physically active. I work for a major soft drink distributor. I set up and tear down displays. I fill the shelves and the coolers, and it's a very physical job. That's the one part about the job I'd really do like. On average, Travis works 50 hours a week, and the last thing he expects to have time for is romance. Some mutual friends of ours introduced us, set us up on a blind date, and there was an instant attraction, an instant spark. Jenna made me laugh, which is not something I was used to with any other woman that I've ever met. But what I love most about Jenna is pretty much what I still do. She's funny, she's very smart, and I just feel real comfortable with her in every way. Travis is also totally taken in by her compassion. Jenna is a nurse at the local hospital. I've always wanted to help people. 
I love interacting with my patients and taking care of them and getting to know them. And if I can help alleviate their fear, that's a real win for me. Over the next two years, the couple is almost inseparable. And soon they make a momentous decision. They're ready to tie the knot. We decided to go to Las Vegas to get married because that's where his best friend lived. And we wanted everybody to be a part of it. So my mom and dad and sister and best friend, and we all flew to Vegas and got married in Vegas. <laughs> the years after the wedding couldn't be happier or healthier for the Walkers. But during the summer of 2009, Travis suddenly develops an odd bump on his left index finger. I didn't really give it much thought. So it was just a little bitty white dot, looked like a little pimple on there. Nicks and cuts are very common for Travis at his job, so I thought that he had just cut himself and gotten an infection. But to their surprise, the strange swollen gash seems to get bigger over the next two weeks. It went from a little spot on my knuckle to really the size of my knuckle. I decided then to make an appointment with Travis's family doctor. She just looked at it and decided that it was an infection. She didn't seem worried at all. The doctor prescribed for Travis an antibiotic. The doctor thought that it would be about a week before the bump would go down. It actually got worse. After a few weeks, it went from like a small yellow pimple to a big red bump. At this point, the bump was just a little bit bigger than maybe a nickel. I was actually surprised that something that started out so simple had turned into something so big. At that point, it was actually getting to where it was difficult to move my finger. I was thinking, I'm on all this medication, then why am I not getting any better? Alarmed by the strange development, Travis heads back in to see his doctor, who orders a round of blood work and an x-ray of his hand. She wasn't really sure what was wrong with him. She felt a rheumatologist might be able to help. The rheumatologist looked at Travis, reviewed his lab work, looked at his x-rays, and diagnosed Travis with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an incurable disease in which the immune system attacks the joints, causing swelling, disfiguration, and difficulty performing daily activities. We were both devastated with that diagnosis. It was gonna mean constant treatment because there's no cure for it. I was getting worried about how this was gonna affect my work. To see someone as active and vibrant as Travis with this disease was saddening. It's not fair. Three months ago, Travis Walker developed a small bump on his left index finger. But now it's almost four inches wide. And his doctor is confident that he has rheumatoid arthritis, an incurable and crippling condition. The rheumatologist started Travis on steroids designed to keep the rheumatoid arthritis symptoms at bay for as long as possible. But the steroids don't help at all. In fact, over the next three weeks, the mysterious lesion only gets worse. The swelling and the pain actually spread from my finger to my pinky and all the way back to my wrist. At one point, I couldn't move my wrist at all. My fingers were very swollen. The skin was actually peeling, and it was unbearable. That's when I knew that something was really wrong. This wasn't adding up. Travis wasn't getting better. When the walkers check in with the doctor, he encourages them to give the medicine some time to kick in. And Travis does the best he can to cope with the excruciating pain. But it's becoming harder and harder to do his job. I was losing mobility by the day, and it was more pain than I ever experienced. Travis had to take a medical leave from work. There was no possible way that he could perform his job with one hand. At home, Travis was much more reliant on me to help him with his daily activities because with one hand, even something as simple as taking a shower became cumbersome. I couldn't believe how much worse things had gotten. After four weeks of no improvement, we went back to the rheumatologist and we got an MRI of Travis's hand. Just really the entire situation, you know, it just wore me out, just overwhelmed me, you know, I just start crying. The rheumatologist saw on Travis's MRI an abscess, which is a collection of pus from an infection. 
Concerned that the infection will spread, the rheumatologist recommends immediate surgery to drain the abscess. And Gina contacts Dr. Rex Peterson, an orthopedic surgeon at the hospital where she works. Jenna called me about Travis and we got him in the office the same day. When I first saw Travis, he had a very tender left hand. I didn't believe that Travis had rheumatoid arthritis. He really didn't have a lot of the symptoms that I would have laid on rheumatoid arthritis. The abscess was so bad, there was fluid oozing out of his finger. Dr. Peterson looked at Travis's hand and decided we needed to do surgery right now. Abscesses get worse and worse, and they can get to where the patient becomes toxic, and sometimes they can be life-threatening. He laid me down on his table, started cutting my hand open, and I definitely wasn't looking at it. I could feel the knife going through it, and I can hear it also. Once the engorged abscess is drained, Dr. Peterson sends out blood samples to determine what kind of infection they're dealing with. And while they wait for the results at home, Jenna keeps a close eye on the open wound. And once we got it drained out and packed, it still hurt, just about the same as it did when I walked in. I didn't want to even look at my hand. Finally, a few days later, the findings are in, and they're all negative for any type of infection, which leaves only one horrifying possibility. Sometimes cancers present like infection, so it's something that we needed to consider. That's when the tears started, and I chose not to tell Travis at this point. It was really hard because I felt like this could potentially end Travis's life. Over the last three months, a small bump on Travis Walker's finger has transformed into a horrifying red abscess that's engulfed his entire left hand. His doctor is confident that it's not an infection and now suspects that he may have cancer. Travis was looking to me to be strong. When Dr. Peterson told me that this may be cancer, I was so overcome by fear and emotion. That afternoon, Travis undergoes a biopsy to confirm the doctor's hunch. Dr. Peterson told me that it may take seven days to get the pathology back. Those seven days felt like seven years. The culture results that came back and they were all negative. I was so relieved that Travis didn't have cancer, but it still gave us no answer. And still not knowing what was wrong with Travis at this point, was just overwhelming. Determined to get to the bottom of Travis's case, Dr. Peterson begins searching for a new theory and continues to treat the harrowing lesion. Every day, Dr. Peterson would remove the packing, he would irrigate where the abscess had been, and he would repack it so that it would continue to drain. But no matter what he does, the wound is spreading up Travis's arm. Even more alarming, he's starting to lose his skin. There were new areas coming up that were forming abscesses. So that became very alarming to me. And just when they think it can't get any worse, Travis takes a terrifying turn. I went to work and when I came home, I found Travis in bed and he was very lethargic and tired. He looked dehydrated, his lips were cracked. And then she started taking my temperature and my vital signs and I could see that she was worried. I found that he had a um, temperature at that point and his heart rate was very fast and his blood pressure was low. I knew that something was really seriously wrong. I immediately put him in the car. I was scared to death. I was just really weak and just feeling really nauseous and really nervous. When we first came into the hospital, we were immediately taken back to the ICU. They confirmed that he was septic. Septic shock is an often fatal condition in which a massive infection causes total organ failure. We immediately began IV fluids to help Travis's body compensate. At this point, my memory started having a lot of blank spots. With sepsis, the person's systems began to shut down. Travis was fading in and out of consciousness. 
His heart was beating extremely fast. His blood pressure was low. He was confused, delirious, and he had a fever of 103. All I could do was pray. I was fearful that Travis would die. Over the past six months, a bizarre, excruciating infection has spread from Travis Walker's hand all the way up his arm. And no doctor seems to know what's going on. Now he's in the hospital, and the medical team believes he's going into septic shock, which can be fatal. In a race against time, doctors are doing everything they can to stabilize him. Travis started slipping in and out of consciousness. I don't really know how to explain how I felt. I was just so scared, I didn't know what to do. At this point, I was really you know, on so much pain medication that it really probably kept me from really thinking about what was really going on. It's touch and go, but after several hours of tense waiting, Travis finally begins to respond to the medication. Thank God they were able to stabilize Travis's vital signs, but we had no definitive diagnosis. Travis had been in the ICU for a few days when Dr. Peterson took me out into the hallway. I remember asking him, is Travis going to live? And he said, I think I can save his life, but I'm not sure I can save his arm. It was like getting kicked in the stomach. I couldn't breathe when he first said it. My immediate reaction was, you know, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I couldn't even tell Travis that he might lose his arm. Jenna was shocked when I made that expression to her, and she became very tearful and pleaded with me not to cut his arm off. At some hesitancy, and with Jenna's pleading, I decided not to amputate his arm and that we would go ahead and continue to treat the abscesses one at a time as they progressed. When it comes down to uh, my level of commitment to my patients, It's a personal thing. I try to treat my patients like I would my family. But it's a risky decision. The mysterious infection could turn toxic at any moment. Desperate for answers, Dr. Peterson digs even deeper into his medical journals. I felt like we were running out of time. Travis might not make it if we couldn't find out what was causing it, what his diagnosis was. Almost five days later, Dr. Peterson comes across a case that seems to fit Travis's to a T. He begins to grill Jenna about their lives. And something she says gives him the clue he needs. But it's imperative that Travis undergo one final test to confirm his hunch. An hour later, the results are in. Dr. Peterson came into the ICU room, and I could tell by the look on his face he had an answer. We decided to go ahead and move forward with the Mycobacterium merum as our presumptive diagnosis. Mycobacterium marinum is a very rare bacteria that normally lives in oceans, lakes, and rivers. In a healthy individual, the skin protects the body from harmful bacteria that can invade it. But in Travis's case, a small puncture wound on his knuckle allowed the bacteria to enter his system and become a raging infection. When we look back on the history, he punctured his finger at work, got a little sliver or something into his finger, and then he went home and cleaned out his fish tank, which were tropical fish who have this bacteria on them. I never thought that I could possibly get an incredibly terrible disease from my home fish tank. The bacteria gets in the body, and it this forms a little red bump. And the body's mechanism of defense is to cause the inflammation. The abscesses then are the body's pumping in a lot of white blood cells, killing a lot of bacteria. The bacteria die, and that's what makes the pus. And eventually, it goes up into your blood system and then you become septic and the person gets very sick and eventually overwhelms the system enough to where it kills the patient. If they hadn't made a correct diagnosis, Travis at very minimum would have lost his arm, if not his life. With no time to spare, Travis is placed on a powerful antibiotic 
that specifically targets Mycobacterium marinum. And amazingly, within just a few hours, Dr. Peterson notices an improvement. I was incredibly relieved that Travis's condition was curable. It's hard to think that a healthy 39-year-old man could be on the brink of death because of a small puncture wound on your hand in a fish tank. But I thank God every day that it didn't take his life or his arm. You know, when I look at the pictures, I'm just glad and thankful that it's over. Just thankful that it's done and I'm gonna be okay. I think it became something special for me to be able to see Travis progress and to see him get better. And you always feel good when you see that happen. He's a great guy. You can't help but like him. The doctor's prognosis was that I would be completely cured from Mycobacterium marinum. While the walkers will be forever grateful to Dr. Peterson, they can't help but wonder why it took so long to land a solid diagnosis. What happened to Travis was very rare. I had never treated a case of Mycobacterium marinum. In the United States, we see about 160 individuals infected by that bacterium per year. Just one week ago, 25-year-old Tammy Gilliland had a simple case of mono. Now she's hovering between life and death. Tammy has just been diagnosed with ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, an extremely rare disease that has already paralyzed her from the chest down and is rapidly moving up her body. I was totally out of it and uh, just in complete survival mode and not even conscious survival mode. I think that I could have gone to sleep and never woken up again and not known the difference. After I had established the diagnosis of ADEM, I knew that the patient was at high risk for complete paralysis and loss of ability to even breathe without life support. And I knew that we had to act quickly to keep the patient alive. At the time that the diagnosis was made, there really was no known treatment. So throughout that night, I did research and found a lot of evidence supporting the use of high-dose IV steroids. Dr. McPherson immediately starts Tammy on the medication, but there's no guarantee the treatment will work. It was important to notify the patient and the family of what this could possibly mean. And while that's difficult to tell a patient that they have a serious neurological problem, while they're laying in bed paralyzed, it's something that's necessary. Dr. McPherson said the nervous system can be very fickle and what nerves decide to come back and function properly. So we knew that there were um, a million different scenarios that could happen with Tammy and we just didn't know which one to expect. Within hours of starting the IV steroids, her sensory exam started to already show improvement. The tingling and num numbness started descending. It's, she started to be able to feel things further and further and further down. And then, you know, very slowly, you know, I could feel, again, my midsection, I could feel it. And then I could feel my thighs, and, and then I could feel my knees, and it was just such a relief to feel like, okay, you know, this is, this is gonna fix this thing. Within five or six days, the patient was pretty much clear of her acute illness. She had lost a lot of muscle. Her nerves no longer knew how to control the muscles. And she was then transferred from the hospital to the rehab facility in order to get further treatment. Tammy didn't have a lot of strength. It was almost like her muscles just were non-existent. I had hours of physical therapy. And initially it was just working on the ability to stand and then it was taking steps. I remember the first step was just such a triumph. Just being so excited and thrilled that that hurdle was crossed. Finally, after two long months of intense physical therapy, Tammy returns home. It was so fantastic just sleeping in my own bed again being able to be out in the fresh air and being able to ride in a car and have my normal life back. It was so good to have Tammy home. That's when I knew. I was like, okay, we're going to be fine. 
While the family is ecstatic that Tammy is walking again, they can't help but wonder why the lethal disease wasn't diagnosed before the paralysis set in. Initially, Tammy's symptoms indicated just a common viral illness and the progression of her illness that was quite rapid indicated that she had something more serious and rare going on. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is very rare. It affects about eight per one million people per year. And this was my first case of actually seeing ADEM, and I still have not seen another case. Today, almost 12 years later, Tammy is 37 years old. She's extremely grateful for her family, the greatest joy in her life. I ended up moving back home to Colorado, and I met my husband, and now we have our daughter, Olivia, who is the light of my life. We bought a house a couple years ago. Everything really has just worked out phenomenally. Tammy today is just great. She married a wonderful man, and she has a beautiful daughter. I think when you've been as sick as Tammy was, you don't take it for granted. Every day is something really special. I could not have made it through without um, my sister Julia and my mom and dad. There's no way that I would have made a recovery um, at all, you know. The experience of the illness really has just changed me. If somebody had told me when I was 23 or 24 that I would go through this and come out on the other end and, you know, feel so blessed and so just successful in life in every way. I would never have believed that I could even make it through that illness. So just to know that I have that kind of inner strength and fortitude is, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome and it really just propels me in life. Today, Travis has fully recovered from the infection and is living a happy and healthy life. My hand is mostly mobile, but there are a couple of fingers that I can't bend all the way. But I'm very glad and thankful to be healthy again. He still has an aquarium, but Travis now takes safety precautions when he's cleaning the tank. Yes, I love taking care of my fish, but I don't put my hands in there without having gloves on. I'm incredibly amazed that this spiral so far out of control. It started out as a tiny little bump and ended up with Travis fighting for his life. You get these glimpses of what your life would be like without this person who is so important to you that you love so much. And I literally couldn't face the idea of not having him there. I'm so thankful for Jenna and Dr. Peterson's perseverance and that they didn't give up on me. 